Hi everybody, thanks for joining us. It is so good to have you join with Christian Life Church for our service today. And we are always happy to hear from you. You can contact us at clcwinnipeg.ca. And if you're joining us by Facebook or YouTube, uh, right in the line bes beside the screen that, that you're here, and, and we'd love to say hello to you and interact with you a little bit as we uh, have church today. And you might be joining us from another part of the country, another part of the world. And we're just glad you came and we hope you enjoy the service today. Uh, we, have, we have communion today. We're going to take communion at the end of my message. Uh, we're going to open up the scriptures. And uh, so get ready for communion. Run to your fridge, get some juice and a cracker, or a piece of bread, whatever. And we're going to do that at the end of the service. Also, uh, Scott's going to be leading us in worship in just a couple of moments here, and uh, we hope that you enjoy the service. Why don't, we, why don't we pray? And we'll start this with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you today, and we thank you for the chance that we have to get together online as, as a community that reaches uh, across our city and, and around the world. And we pray that as we're here today worshiping you, that you would be lifted up, you would be exalted, and that people would be encouraged and inspired to keep living and keep living for you. And so Lord, we ask that your blessing would be upon everything that's said and done. In Jesus' name, amen. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you, there is none besides you. Open up my eyes in wonder. And show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one say you're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you oh we live for you and holy there is no one like you there is none besides you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me and holy there is no one like you there is none besides you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead to those around and I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and I will put my trust in you alone and i will not be shaken i will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and 
Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. So what could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. could not hold you, the veil tore before you, you silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus.
want to talk to you today for a few minutes about uh, what the coronavirus teaches us about relationships. And so there's a couple of questions that uh, I think need to be asked. Uh, what's life going to be like for you when this is all over? Uh, do you think people are going to, after coronavirus is all over and we're all able to leave our homes again and, and, and things are opened up, do you think we're all going to flock back to restaurants and coffee shops and entertainment venues? Do you think our churches are going to all be full again? Or do you think people are just going to have learned the value and the joy of being at home and stay home a little bit more? What is normal going to look like? What's the new normal going to be for you? I'm asking those questions and lots of people are asking those questions because we're living in, in a time that nobody's experienced before. And um, at least in our lifetime. And, and it's all brand new and everybody's trying to figure this out and nobody really knows what the answers to those questions are. But there are some things that the coronavirus uh, is teaching us. And I want to talk about some of those things today. When, when I think about some of the things that the coronavirus is teaching us, I, I want to focus in on what the coronavirus is teaching us about relationships. Now, we all have different kinds of relationships. We have, uh, there's, for example, there's, there's a, a close relationships that we might have. And that's the, the person that comes over to your home and you welcome them and you're glad to see them. You might have a barbecue together, sit down, have a meal. And you have conversation. You talk about things. You, you, you open up your, your life to them and, and you, you share some, some things that, that may be deeply personal. Those are close relationships. Then we also have transactional relationships. That's the pizza guy that shows up at your door and hands you a box and, and you give him 20 bucks. That's a transactional relationship. We have all kinds of those. It could be our lawyer. It could be our doctor. It could be our mechanic. Uh, it could be the, the person at the grocery store. It could be somebody at the coffee shop, the barista that you, you see on a regular basis. It's basically a transactional relationship. Uh, relationship. Now, I think that so many of our relationships are transactional and they can even be transactional uh, in the church. When, when I look back at so many relationships that people have in a church, they may come to church because uh, they have a program for my kids. Uh, I like what the pastor has to say. Uh, I like the environment. I like the music. I like the worship team. And, and so a lot of those relationships may not be close or intimate in any way, shape, or form, but they're transactional. We, we are in them because of what they do for us. And you, you give me something, I, I receive something, I give you something, you receive something. Transactional relationships. So those are the kinds of relationships that, that all of us have. Close relationships and transactional relationships. And the reality is most of us have a lot of transactional relationships and very few close relationships. And we're made to be in relationship with other people. In Genesis, uh, with Adam, God said right from the very beginning, he says, not good for man to be alone. And so God went on to create Eve so that Adam wouldn't be alone in the garden. We are made in our human nature to be together with other people. Uh, just to sort of illustrate that, the other day my wife went to Costco and I don't know where you might be joining us from, but in our city, uh, sometimes uh, the lineup, we went there early one morning and the lineup to get into Costco at nine o'clock in the morning, half an hour before the doors open, went around three sides of the building to get into the front door. And what has been happening in these lineups are people are so happy to be out of their homes and so happy to be around other living, talking, breathing individuals that they're visiting and they're talking and they're, 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 they're laughing and they're joking. They're just so happy to be able to talk to someone and have a conversation. Why? Because we are built for relationship and we're built to be together with other people. And it's interesting, 
Um, one of the things that, that I'm hearing people say to me is, man, I miss people. I miss my friends. And I've been talking to, to different people in our church and they're like, oh man, I miss being at church. I, I miss shaking hands. And, and, and a few people said, I miss the hugs. I miss being hugged. I miss hugging people. I miss being close to my friends. I, I am just so lonely for people. And so these are, are things that are being said. And I, I think in the midst of it, we're definitely learning something about relationships through this coronavirus. Um, the other day, uh, actually the last couple of weeks, I've, I've performed a couple of uh, memorial services. And, and uh, there's, you know, there's some I've done in the funeral home. And the only person there is the guy recording the service. And the service has been online. And, and in other situations, there's been very small gatherings, family members. And it's the strangest thing to, to do a funeral and, and share some words of comfort with people who are brokenhearted and grieving. And at the end of the funeral, for everybody to just keep their distance from each other and uh, say, well, you know, sorry, your loved one passed away and you really do feel bad and not be able to shake their hand, not be able to put your hand on their shoulder, not be able to give them a hug. Not be able to, to really physically uh, offer any kind of, of, of comfort. You see, the human touch is something that we are built for. The human touch conveys empathy. Uh, it, it conveys love. It, it com conveys, uh, I'm here for you. I, I, I care for you. I, I'm present here for you. That's what the human touch does for us. And, and we're starved of human touch right now. And so... The, the coronavirus is certainly teaching us that, man, I miss being with people. I miss human touch. I miss those hugs. I miss those handshakes. It's just so natural for us and, and uh, just a, an acceptable part of our life. And so here's a few lessons I think that the coronavirus is teaching us. And I want to just share these quickly with you. The first one is this, that being alone isn't always... A choice and I think of some of the the times when people find themselves alone when maybe they haven't made the choice to be alone like for instance a spouse dies we don't choose to have uh, someone that that we've been married to die of, of a sickness or, or age or disease we don't choose that and then suddenly you find you're alone at home and you haven't chosen that it happens. Sometimes people find themselves alone because they've had a divorce, a separation. And, and now we're finding ourselves alone because of quarantine orders or, or maybe you're, you're running a coffee shop and it's been closed down and you're home, you're alone. You can't be with your clients, with your friends, with the people you work with. There's all kinds of things that happen where being alone isn't always a choice. Now there's a, a story in, in, in the scriptures of, of David who was fleeing from King Saul and King Saul was wanting to kill David. David was a young fellow. He was next in line to be the king. Saul was very jealous of him and he wanted to get rid of him. At one point, David was hiding in a cave. He was... He was, like you could say, he was isolated. He was quarantined almost, it was, to a cave to protect himself from sure death if Saul ever got his hands on him. And so David writes in Psalm 57. He says, have mercy on me, my God. Have mercy on me. For in you I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. That's an interesting thing. He, he talks about taking refuge in the shadow of God's wings. Now, God was not a bird. Uh, that is not uh, anything more than a metaphor. It's a description. It, it is a description of, of God covering over him, of hovering over him, of God protecting him. And David's saying, I am taking refuge 
God, in, in your presence, in your covering, until this disaster passes by me. And, and, and that's where a lot of us find ourselves today is, is we are taking refuge in our caves, in our homes until the danger passes by. But sometimes just being in the cave and the environment isn't enough. We need the, the comfort of God. We need the presence of God. We need him to be with us in that cave or in our home so that we can feel safe and secure, so that we can be at peace, so that we can have some hope. And so being alone isn't always a choice. And David found himself in a situation that he normally wouldn't have chosen for himself. He didn't want to be on the run. He didn't want to be hiding in a cave. What kind of a life is that? And so we find ourselves feeling much the same way. I, I don't want to be alone. I don't want to be at home. I don't want to be isolated. I want to be out and about. I want to be doing stuff. But then there's the stuff that goes on in our heads and our hearts, our thoughts, our minds. Where do they go? Well, we need to take refuge in the shadow of God's wings, metaphorically, and take comfort in him. Know he's with us. Know we're not alone. Know that we're going to get through this. Know that there's always hope. I think that's something that the coronavirus is teaching us is that being alone isn't always a choice, but God can be with us regardless. And we're going to get through it with his help. Second thing I think that the coronavirus is teaching us about relationships is that being lonely may be a choice. Now, there's one thing to be alone, but there's something else about being lonely. Lonely. Did you know that uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the United Kingdom appointed their first minister for loneliness? Their first minister for loneliness. They, they did a survey and they found that up to 10% of young adults between the ages of 16 and 24 frequently or always feel lonely. And they've, they've d discovered that or determined that this is a, a real uh, public health hazard and, and, and a social issue that, that we need as a government to address, the, the loneliness of people. In, in, um, in Japan, they have found that there are roughly 500,000 people living as modern day hermits. So they're, they're living in this, this world where, um, you know, we're inundated with email, with text messages, uh, maybe phone calls, um, likes, pictures, graphics, you know, all kinds of different things that come into us through, through media and through social media. And what they're finding is some people are becoming addicted to the internet, uh, maybe to gaming and uh, maybe some of them have found that, that they've been somewhat burned out by it all. And so they begin to socially isolate themselves. And they're actually saying that some of these people haven't left their homes in years. In years. They've completely isolated themselves from society. Some 500,000. And it's not just an Asian problem. It's not just in, in, uh, in Japan. But they're finding that in Spain, in France, in Italy, and I'm sure in virtually every other country where technology abounds, that there are people that are in that situation. And so they may find themselves uh, in the place where they have chosen, because they've isolated themselves, they've chosen a path of extreme loneliness. That's a very extreme situation. But it is troubling to find out that, you know, like in the UK, that some 10% of young people between ages of 16 and 24 find themselves lonely all the time or, or a good portion of the time. Statistically, they say that's three times higher than people that are 65 years and older. Now we know and I think we're, we're certainly discovering that in the midst of all that we're going through today with the isolation, that we need to be a little more sensitive to our grandmothers and grandfathers, our, our senior citizens, who every day 
are going through loneliness like what we're experiencing today. They don't have their cars. Uh, they don't have their independence. They're completely dependent on other people. I think of, of grandmothers and grandfathers and people in nursing homes, some of them who never get visits from their family members. I think we're learning something from that. I think we're learning that that just because you, you've you fixed a problem by putting grandma or grandpa away, you haven't really fixed the problem. But those people need interaction. They need human touch. They need human contact. And, and I hope that that there is an increase in, in the care and the visiting and the reaching out and the looking after of, of people who are finding themselves in situations where they are really, really lonely. Um, human relationships are never perfect. They're absolutely messy at times. Human relationships, people, when they get into situations where they're hurt, where they may feel betrayed, uh, will sometimes withdraw from relationships. In other words, they, they quit. I'm quitting this relationship. In, in uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, it says, bear with one another. And I think sometimes um, we replace that with uh, put up with each other. Sometimes bearing with each other is bearing each other, putting up with each other. And that's oftentimes what relationships are boiled down to. When we look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 14, it says, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you'll be destroyed by each other. And so we, we look at human relationships and, and we look at how we can mistreat one another, how we can be hurt by one another. And then what happens with some people is their reaction to that is I'm going to withdraw from that relationship. And maybe uh, we just very easily get into the habit of breaking relationships if we feel that we're threatened or if something bad is coming. And so we just begin to, to um, isolate ourselves more and more. The, the picture of a tent uh, comes to mind. And uh, sometimes what, what we mistakenly do is we start with a tent and there's a whole bunch of people in that tent and, and we're all in relationship and somebody, somebody hurts you. And so you pick up the, pen, the tent pegs and you, you move them in a little closer to you and you leave that person outside of the tent. You follow where I'm going with this? You get rejected. Uh, uh, somebody says something about you and that tent gets smaller and smaller and smaller until you get to the point where it's just you in your tent. And that is a place where we find ourselves where loneliness may in fact be a choice, a choice that we've made over a series of years or through a series of broken relationships and we end up alone in our tent. So being lonely can be a choice. It can be a choice because we withdraw from relationships. We withdraw from other people. We push others away. So that's something I think that the coronavirus is teaching us. Is that being alone may not be a choice. But being lonely may be a choice. And if you are alone, you don't have to be lonely. We have the, the tools, the means, the mechanisms of telephone, of communication, of all those different things to be able to pick up the phone and say, I want to talk to you today. I need, I need some company. I need, to, I, need to, I need to have a conversation because I'm lonely. And what I'm trying to say here is sometimes loneliness is our responsibility to counteract. Another thing that um, the coronavirus is teaching us about relationships is that we're made for deep personal connection. The isolation of, of the last few weeks has certainly reminded us of how much we love and need to be connected. I think that a lot of people that I'm talking to are learning how much they actually value relationships. And I, I wonder sometimes if we have taken for granted 
the relationships that, that we enjoy, that we have. We haven't appreciated the relationships that we have. We haven't appreciated all the people in our circle. And I think that's one thing that the coronavirus is teaching us is that, that I'm made, you are made for personal connection, for deep personal connection with others. And I'm, I'm hearing stories almost on a daily basis of people that are phoning each other, they're emailing each other, they're, they're caring for each other because they've recognized that they're made for deep connection and, and their friends need connection too. And so I've been encouraging people and I want to encourage you, don't wait for your phone to ring. Phone somebody, get in touch with somebody. Uh, don't wait for somebody uh, to reach out to you, but don't just respond, but, but initiate and act upon things and, and get out there and, and reach out to people. I believe that, that the coronavirus in many ways is, is teaching us that we've taken our togetherness for granted. And I think that when all of this is over and we're able to get back together again, that there is going to be a deep appreciation for physical contact and for face-to-face -face communication and, and for friendship. I think there's going to be a, great, a greater appreciation for it. Uh, Galatians chapter 6. I'm just kind of hovering in the last couple of chapters of Galatians, as you can tell today. But Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. It says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who are part of the family of believers, the family of God. And that's an interesting thing. You know, there is a good reason for you and I to have Jesus in our heart. There's a good reason for you and I to have a relationship, a personal relationship with God by accepting his son, Jesus Christ, into our heart. Because what it does is it brings you in to God's family, the family of God. We often refer to it also as the body of Christ. And the Bible talks about this family of God, this, this spiritual family that, that we get to be part of. And sometimes for people, uh, especially if they come out of a hurting family or a, a, a very dysfunctional family or they've experienced rejection, for some people that's the only family they know. And, and maybe it's the best family they've ever had, but there's this deep personal connection. Joanne and I have had an incredible privilege of being able to worship with believers in other countries and churches around the world. And you walk in and you feel like you're with family. You just feel like you belong. There's this acceptance and there's this love and, and it's like, I'm not alone in this world. I, I belong. And so there's a good reason for us to have Jesus as our Savior because we get to enjoy a pretty large family and it brings us into this place of having new relationships and, and new friendships and people that we're able to connect with. The coronavirus is teaching us the value of relationships. It's teaching us the value of our own families, our, our brothers, our sisters, our moms, our dads, our children. It's teaching us the value of, of friends, the friends that you have. It's teaching us value of the people that you work with, the relationships you have with them. The, it's teaching us the value of, of, of the transactional relationships. So maybe those transactional relationships could go deeper. That you can actually not just receive a cup of coffee from your barista, but kind of get to know them a little bit. Find out what's going on in their lives. Um, I think the coronavirus is teaching us the value of relationships. And, and I think that the coronavirus is teaching us the, the value of a renewed sense of closeness to other people. And the importance of really investing in them and making friends of others. I think the last thing that the coronavirus is teaching us is that relationships are more important than stuff. Relationships are more important than the things we accumulate, the money we earn. Relationships are really important. A number of years ago, we were pastoring in a small community and it was a mining town. Now there were four communities in that area that uh, people lived in and 
you know, the main industry there was mining. And, and there were four main mines that within, I think it was days of each other. I, I can't really remember, but I think it was date within days of each other where three mines went on strike and one mine closed down. And it plunged us into a seven month long strike. And people went from uh, earning, you know, families having a, a, a family income of, you know, 100,000 or more a year. This is a number of years ago. So it was really good money everybody was making. To living on food hampers that were supplied by the union. And I think $100 a month or something like that for spending money. So, so you go from having a, a good income and living well and making more than a lot of people in other parts of the country to living on the contribution of a food hamper and, and about 100 or so dollars a month. I, I'm not sure if I got those figures right, but it was pretty low. What was interesting is we were pastoring a church and... Up until the mines closed down, everything was going good. It was pretty normal, you know. You're running ministries and programs and people are coming and things are happening and everything's pretty normal. And all of a sudden, the big crash comes and, and everything stops. Programs just ended. Uh, we could barely, you know, function because people were moving away to get other jobs and, and personal tragedies taking place in people's lives and difficulties. And so what I found was interesting was, was that we would meet on Friday morning and have breakfast. The men in the church would meet in the basement of the church and we'd have breakfast. And we would talk. Well, that breakfast would last all morning long. And what was happening was, you know, one week a guy would come and, and he was really discouraged and, and, I mean, really feeling beat down. And the guys, you know, we'd eat and we'd, we'd laugh and we'd joke a little bit. And then they would just begin to pour into each other and encourage that guy that was down. And then we'd pray for him and, and, and he'd leave feeling better. But the next week, it might be one of the other guys. And, and we would build that person up and encourage them and, and, and help them to dispel some of the fear and anxiety about what they were going through. And, and the next week, it would be somebody else. And on and on it went like that for... I don't know, for several weeks or several months. I, I can't really remember. But I remember walking away from that saying, you know, if everything comes crashing down, it's not the programs that sustain us. It's not the structures. It's not the, the function, the functioning, you know, the moving wheels, the moving parts of a church that, that sustain us. It's relationships. It's relationships. And I'm seeing it again. I'm seeing it again where... Uh, in a day, I mean, all of a sudden all the churches are closed and what's happening? It's relationships, relationships that are, are carrying people through and relationships matter more than stuff. Relationships matter more than programs. Relationships matter uh, when everything else stops. Relationships matter and we need each other. And um, Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 says, and I think this is a new reality for us, carry each other's burdens and in this way you fulfill the law of Christ. Well, what does that refer to? I think it goes back to this. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you love each other, if you love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing exactly what God wants you to do. And it, it brings me back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The love chapter. The chapter we read at weddings. And it talks about what love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love hopes. It perseveres. Love protects. Now, I'm kind of paraphrasing it. And pulling out the, the elements of it that really do apply to our situation today. Those are the things that, 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 that we need to express in our love today for each other. Carry each other's burdens. And if you do that, you're fulfilling the law of Christ. Love your neighbor as yourself. And here's what love looks like. Protect each other. Care for each other. Be kind to each other. Watch out for each other. Persevere. Build hope in each other. Encourage each other and build each other up. We're going to get through this. It's going to be okay. God's in control. 
And when you're alone in your cave, in your home, take refuge in the shadow of the Almighty. He's got you covered and he's watching out for you. I just want to close with these words. Maybe, maybe you're listening today and, and, and you're searching for God. You're searching for answers. You're trying to make sense of, of what's going on in the world today. Maybe you're dealing with a lot of fear and, and a lot of anxiety. And I want to share with you today that there is hope and you can find courage and you can find peace by having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You can, you can say, Lord Jesus, forgive my sins. I, I, I'm far away from you. I ask you to forgive my sins. Come into my life. Be my savior. I receive you. That's where it all starts. When you do that, you're now entering into a, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And it opens you up to having a relationship with the body of Christ, with the family of God. And so what we'd like to do, what I invite you to do, if, if you prayed that prayer, uh, click the link on, uh, on the page that you're looking at this message on and let us know. And, and we want to invite you into our community. We want to invite you to be part of, of the family of God and, and to be able to, to share with you and, and to encourage you and, and to pray with you. You don't have to be alone. You don't have to go through this alone. You don't have to be lonely. You can get through this. And we want to walk with you through it. Let me pray with you as, as I close today. Heavenly Father, I come to you today. And I thank you for those that, that prayed that prayer. Lord Jesus, come into my life and forgive my sins. Be my Lord and Savior. I thank you that, that you hear that prayer and you answer it. And I pray for those today that are at home and they're lonely. That they would choose. That they would choose to reach out to other people and, and, uh, and, and, and find encouragement, find fellowship and relationship with each other. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would build us up, that you would cover us, that you'd give us peace and encouragement and warmth in our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have communion at this time. And uh, I actually have a... Uh, a little cup of communion juice and a little wafer. And um, you can pause the video if you want and run to the kitchen and grab your own. But we're going to have communion. So communion is something that we celebrate together as the body of Christ. We're encouraged to remember the Lord's death until he comes. And Jesus is coming again. He's coming soon. And this is a way to remind us of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us in coming and dying on the cross and rising from the dead and ascending to heaven. And he's coming again. He's coming again. He's in control. He's coming again. And so, Lord, bless these emblems as we partake together in Jesus' name, amen. So the Bible says that Jesus took the bread. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we partake of the bread together. Let's do that. And so Jesus was with his disciples that last supper and he takes the cup of wine and he says this cup is a new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me let's partake of the cup together and we celebrate the life of Jesus. We live for Jesus and we love Jesus and we look forward to him coming again. I want to thank you for joining us today. Thanks for being part of our service and we want to hear from you. So drop us a note. clcwinnipeg.ca is our website. You can give to our ministry uh, through our website. 
But more than anything, we want to just hear from you. We want to have a, we want to have a relationship with you. And we'd love to start today. Thanks for joining us and God willing, we'll see you next Sunday, same place, same time, 11 o'clock Central Standard Time. Thanks for joining us in Winnipeg, Manitoba. God bless you.